So welcome. This is the uh, Canadian Himalayas, Whistler. <laughs> and uh, my name is Manoj, my wife Jyoti of 26 years. She's not 26, we've been married 26 years. So, <laughs> so we're old. We're old especially when somebody like MC Yogi Baba calls my wife auntie. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for being here. There's a lot to cover. There's like millions of deities that we have one hour. So we're going to give you a Wikipedia version of the whole thing. So <laughs> buckle up. <laughs> Jyoti will go first and I'll go second. Namaste. I would like to start with, uh, with an invocation to Ganesha. Gajananam Bhuta Ganadi Sevitam Kapita Jambhu Palasara Bhakshitam Uma Sutam Shoka Vinashakaranam Namami 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 Vigneshwara Padapankajam Namami Vigneshwara Padapankajam Jai Ganesh. We always start with a prayer to Ganesha because Ganesha is the remover of obstacles. And anything that we take on as a project, we want all of our obstacles removed. And the best way to do it is to invoke the energy of Ganesha. And that's exactly what he will do, remove all the obstacles for us. And I chose this raga. Sariga padasa sadapagarisa. This is the name of the tune that I, this is the scale of the tune that I just sang. I picked this because it is a morning raga. And I think this is still morning, so. <laughs> Usually you sing it at four o'clock in the morning. And then you can feel it. You can feel the morning energy when things are waking up from the deep sleep. So that is appropriate. And there are many other scales that you can choose depending on the time of the day. So today I'm here to talk about the goddess Lakshmi. She's one of my favorite deities because the name Lakshmi comes from the word Lakshya. Lakshya means goal. So we all have some goal or the other and we're all working towards that, right? And we may think that we all have different goals. But if we analyze it, we are all working for same things. Like peace, we are all looking for peace no matter what it is that we are engaged in, right? Security, 
So we earn a living, we make money, so that we may have that security. And when we're not struggling to make the ends meet, there's peace of mind. So peace, security, and what else do we look for? Health, love, happiness, all of these things we look for are very common. So rather than focusing on all the differences among us, if we start focusing on all that we have in common, we are all the same, really. And there are other ways you can look at it, too. Like our bodies we think are unique and different. But we are so alike that medicine works on us, right? Medicine works exactly the same way on us. If we have a headache, we all grab Tylenol. And it works. Why? Because our bodies are very similar. Science exists because it is built on something that is similar. And it's based on the fact that everything is the same. Right? Like um, if, you have a, if you have mental problems, if you have physical problems, we take Tylenol or some medication. But when we have mental problems, we see a psychiatrist. Because our minds are all Similar. That's why the same thing works on everybody, right? Otherwise, if you have to have a unique thing for each and every one of us, you have to have a separate world for each and every one of us. We cannot all live in the same world. So what I'm trying to say is, we are all one more than we realize it. If we think about it, we are all very, very similar. And if you learn to focus on that, we will not have any conflict. We will be able to love anybody easily. There will be absolutely no conflict. So, some of the, what the, the scriptures, the scriptures of um, the Hindus is very, very, very large. It's very vast. It has 1,180 different branches. Okay, and, um, what it does is, it doesn't say, just follow this one path. That's not what it says. What it does exactly the opposite. What it does is, takes all possible human goals and groups it into four. And that is dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. And the human goals is called purushartha. So these are the four goals. I'm going to start with Artha. And Lakshmi represents all of that. And she'll also help you achieve any of those goals. That's why she's very special. Okay? So this lotus on her left hand is Artha. Artha meaning you accumulate wealth. A lot of wealth. Why do we accumulate wealth? So that with that wealth, we can satisfy many different desires of ours. Right? We fulfill desires. Starting from hunger. Right? You have to have artha so that you can buy food and eat. So this is kama. Artha and kama. And then this is dharma. So once we have, what we do is we accumulate wealth and we fulfill our desires with it. And we keep doing that. And then there are, we fulfill our, some of the desires and then there are more desires. And then we fulfill those and then there are more desires. And then we get a little older and then there are different desires. Right? Like as children, we would have wanted toys. And then as we grow older, we, we grow over that. We, and then we start desiring something else. So our desires change, and they become more too. So there'll be more desires. Initially, you'd have 10 desires, and then it'd be 100, and 1,000, and so on and so forth. It just keeps increasing. And then we keep fulfilling them. We're not staying without fulfilling. Of course, we're fulfilling them. But as we fulfill, the list gets, keeps getting longer and longer, right? And then at some point we realize, okay, maybe I'm not getting this right. Maybe 
I should be doing something else. I should be looking, accumulating something else. Because we're now also getting a little bit older, what happens next time around? So if there's going to be a next birth, what are we going to do? So maybe we should collect something that we can take with us. It seems two people died and went to heaven. And then th there was a gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper asked, what have you done? Have you, done, have you cheated people? Have you stole, stolen things? And both of them said, yes. We did, we cheated a lot of people. <laughs> we stole a lot of things. So then uh, the gatekeeper said, show me everything that you have stolen and then you may get in. They didn't have anything to show. So the message is, if you, if you if we keep collecting things in any which way that we can, we're not going to be able to take with us. So now we start thinking about what is it that I can take? So there is something that we can take. That is our good karma. Just by serving people, just by sitting in front of a deity and invoking that energy in your mind, purifying your mind, purifying your thought, all of these things will earn you good karma. Those points you get to take with you. And when the gatekeeper asks, you'll be able to show. You see, it's something like that. This is just a, it's not, don't take it literally, just take it in the right spirit. The reason is, ultimately we are going to find peace of mind. We're going to be so peaceful, no matter what happens, no matter what comes our way, we are able to handle it. Isn't that what we all want? So that's what all of these practices are for. So, but then initially, we do want to accumulate wealth, we do want to fulfill all of those desires. That's natural to us. So Lakshmi says, it's okay. If you ask, I shall give. Okay, so she lets you fulfill all of that. And then naturally, you'll come to this dharma where you're now doing all those activities which will earn you those good karma points. Now you have a bag full, you have a huge bank account full of good karma points. And the next time around, you go to a world which has better, you get better sense organs, and then there are better sense objects. Obviously, when the two interact, the pleasure is much better, you see? So that's what they, they, they start planning long term. Normally, natu I mean, naturally this happens. And then, if you keep doing that, you'll reach a point where, okay, so I go to a better world, and then what? And then you have to do the same thing and go to an even better world, and then what? Do more of these things and go to even... So again, we're caught in this cycle of collecting, expending, collecting, Spending, right? Then you come to moksha. This is total freedom. So Lakshmi Devi goes like this and says, you can be free here and now. There's no need to collect anything. Go somewhere, travel somewhere, and then cash it in, and then enjoy, and then, you know, you don't have to do any of that. You can be free now. Free meaning? Liberation, moksha, that's the last purushartha. Purushartha meaning goal. And how do we do that? And she will let you, she will guide you. All you have to do is stay with Lakshmi, work with her, meditate in front of her, invoke Lakshmi energy, remember all the symbolisms that she stands for, and then you will, find, you will be guided in this direction. And you will find yourself a guru, a teacher, who will teach you what is called Vedanta, the last part of the Vedas. So the beginning point, I told you there are 1,180 branches of the scriptures called Veda. Most of it is how to get artha, how to get, fulfill all your karma, and how to accumulate a lot of punyam for next time around in a better world next time, right? All of those, the most of them are for that. But there's a small portion at the end 
called Veda Anta Bhaga. Veda Anta means the last part of the Vedas. Small portion. And that is full of Upanishads. Which lets you analyze your own self. Okay? So, uh, do you all believe that there's God? Of course, that's why you're here, right? Yes. So, to know God is to know yourself. If you know your true nature, that, what that means, what I, what I just said implies that you don't know yourself. That's what I just said. And that's what the scriptures say too. We think that we know ourselves, but what we think that we are is not our true nature. And we need to do an, uh, conduct an inquiry into that and peel off layers after layers. So am I the body? Am I the mind? Because all of these put together is an individual, isn't it? The body, mind, intellect, our memory faculty, all of these things put together. And then there's consciousness in the body while we are alive, right? All of these put together is that individual that we call I. But then we are able to objectify each of these layers. Objectify meaning we can experience our bodies. So when you, when you have, the moment you have an experience, there are two things. There's an experienced object, and then there's an experiencer. Right? If there aren't two things, you can never have an experience. So if your body is being experienced by you, it's an object of your experience, that means you are other than this body. Same thing goes for your mind. Do you know your mind? Can you experience your mind? It means all the thoughts that come and go. Can you watch them? Have you tried watching them? You can. You can observe every thought that happens in your mind. That means your mind has now become an object of your experience. That means you're other than that. You're the experiencer experiencing your mind. Something that belongs to you, but it is not you. You see, so this kind of inquiry you make, and then you arrive at the awareness. The awareness that is aware of everything. And in that awareness exists this entire universe. That awareness is I. That is your true nature. And that awareness is one. Okay, so this kind of inquiry is made. So when you arrive at that awareness that you are, it is nothing but the same as God. That's why we say namaste. The awareness in me is bowing down to the awareness in you. It's the same thing, it's one and the same thing. Okay. With that I'm going to stop and I'm going to let Manoj tell you some stories. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. And you'll be used to my accent by the time I'm finished. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a really profound statement. What you know, when you do the Vedantic analysis, the the crux is your true nature is God. Okay, it's a bit, it's quite different from many other traditions which say God is a localized entity, like a bearded old white dude in the heavens, yeah? <laughs> Sometimes with an anger management problem, yeah? <laughs> so that reminds me of a joke, and since it's North America, I can say that without being put in jail, yeah? <laughs> so a uh, missionary goes to a swami, and the missionary says to the Swami, hey, you've been a devil worshipper all these years, you know, definitely going to hell, but there's still a chance for you to go to heaven, provided you convert to my religion. So, Swami says, hey, who said that? The missionary tells the Swami, well, God told me that. The Swami tells the missionary, I am God and I didn't tell you that. <laughs> okay, so, you have the philosophy of who you are, 
okay? And your true nature is consciousness or God. And then you have these deities coming out of the woodwork, yeah? And this is in probably the single most puzzling thing for someone who grows up in another culture, you know? And these have been around for thousands of years. And there's a reason why they came. And the reason is, is to explain the same philosophy in very vivid, colorful terms. So, for instance, I remember teaching a workshop in Annapolis, Maryland, about eight years ago on the Mandukya Upanishad, which talks about the three states of consciousness. And it's so intricate and, you know, quite complex and sometimes boring. I saw people nodding to sleep. Even I put myself to sleep, yeah? So the, I became a storyteller because these deities explain the same philosophy in very colorful terms. It's like the Bollywood expression of the philosophy. Like the Bollywood movies are so colorful, okay? But the easiest way to understand them, I'm going to peel a couple of layers for you, is they are archetypes, okay? And the word archetype was coined by the Swiss psychotherapist Carl Jung about 100 years ago. And we teach a lot to uh, psychotherapists about once a month, we come down to Seattle. Uh, there's a community of like 5,000 Jungian psychotherapists and we teach them about these archetypes and they help themselves, counsel their clients, etc. So what Jung said is, these reside within what he called the collective unconscious. In other words, within all of us. So when you see each, each one of us, we're like icebergs, you know? What you see on the top is just a little bit. Underneath is the subconscious where all our, you know, feelings, thoughts, samskaras, the tendencies that, that propel us to do actions, they all reside within the subconscious. And underneath all the subconscious is what is called the collective unconscious, where all these archetypes are buried. And they pop up, especially during moments of transition in your life, and they guide you, okay? And when you truly understand that, and many of you who do yoga, there's a good chance one or more of these are your archetypes. You may not have been exposed to them, that's, that's the only reason. And you have archetypes from many traditions, okay? But the fact that you're doing yoga is there's a good chance one or more of these are your archetypes. So let me jump to, um, let me t jump to the dancing Shiva. Since Jyoti spoke about Lakshmi, the Shiva Nataraj, or the dancing Shiva is probably the most common symbol of yoga. You see it in yoga studios. But it is an archetype of anyone in change in their life, be it a new relationship, a new spiritual path, a new job, a new move, anything radically new. So the flames, the circle with flames of creation are like flames of creation of your own life. We all co-create our own universe, each one of us. And that's because anything that happens to you, good or bad, is because what you've done in the past. That's karma. Karma is now a very common used term, yeah? And that includes past life. That's why inexplicably bad things happen to good people or vice versa. You know, it's coming from karma. So that's a circle of flames. We co-create our own universe. However, there is free will. Because free will is, you know, when you're confronted with a choiceless situation, how do you react? Because by our action, you can create new karma, good or bad. And the free will is shown by the flame Shiva holds in his left hand. And that represents the fire in your belly you need to transform. You're getting out of your comfort zone. And that's his hair is like jada, dreadlocks. So if DJ Baba were to, dress Baba were to let his hair down and dance ecstatically, you become the dancing Shiva, yeah? On the other hand, you also drum, the Damaru, which is the pulse beat of transformation. Everything is vibratory in the universe with the pulsations of Shiva, Shiva's drum. There was a 10th century Sanskrit text called Spanda Karika, which talked about the universe as panda, vibratory. And that's something the physicists only found out like last century, that everything is vibrating. Even this inner table is vibrating. 
Now, when you embark on change, the old thoughts and old relationships, they drag you down, you know? And that's represented by this figure at the bottom. It's called the being of forgetfulness, apasmara, A-P-A-S-M-R-A, apasmara. Smara in Sanskrit means to remember. Like Bhagavad Gita is a smriti, a remembered text, a written and remembered text. Vedas and Upanishads are shruti, a heard text. So apasmara means we literally forget, we become paralyzed, unable to change, get stuck in a rut, become like a deer caught in the headlights, like those are big headlights there. Yeah? So what Shiva does is he steps on his butt, he crushes it, and he teaches us life is about creation and destruction simultaneously. You have to push the old to bring in the new. But here's what happens during conscious change is we worry about the results. And it's very natural, it comes from our ego. See, our ego wants certainty, it wants predictability. Whereas the world is uncertain, okay? So, the ego thinks of the past mistakes we made or projects in the future and says, what if the results don't work out? You know, it's a natural human emotion. For that, Lord Shiva does two things. Number one, he raises his left foot. This is called Kunchita Pada, the foot of upturned grace. And then with his left hand, he makes a grand sweeping gesture to his foot. And he crosses his heart at the same time. So the hands gesturing to his foot, what it means is he's saying, let it go. Surrender. It's called Sharanagati Mudra. So the word, you know, like the word Ganesha Sharanam, same mudra. So the word surrender, you know, you talk to a guy on a street, he would say it's like giving up or losing. But for a yogi, you get everything. It's, you get the infinite. It's like a drop of water merging with the ocean. You and the ocean are the same. Both are water, pure consciousness. So when you truly surrender, with the other hand, he does this. That is the Abhaya Mudra. Bhaya means fear. Abhaya means he removes all fears and uncertainties within you and helps you in your journey to the new transition. So essentially what the message here is, life and yoga, and yoga is primarily of the mat, yoga is life, is a combination of effort and grace. You have to do the effort, the sadhana, to literally surrender, and then grace pours in. Grace is always smiling, but the effort has to be made. It's not the new age path which says, what I call the talking school of enlightenment, which says you're already enlightened, you don't need to do sadhana. That's why Ganesha's trunk is twisted, Baba. Every Ganesh Murti, the trunk is twisted, whereas an elephant's trunk hangs down. The twisted trunk means it's the path of sadhana. And then he offers a suite of enlightenment. So there are, these, there are these symbols which are encoded in the deities, in the murtis, okay? So effort and grace. I like to give this example. You know, Jyoti and I, we travel a lot all over this country. We teach workshops. We, we take these deities with us. We even went to Hong Kong last summer at the Asia Yoga Conference, taught workshops. And these are pretty heavy for some of you who lifted them, yeah? <laughs> and you know, on the plane, you're only allowed like, what, 50 pounds a bag? Southwest means two bags, two of us 400 pounds. Now 200 pounds, still not enough, yeah? But what they don't measure is your hand carry on. <laughs> so there I put many of these small murtis. Yeah? <laughs> and now it weighs like 80 pounds now, yeah? And I have to schlep it onto the plane. Schlepping is a Sanskrit word, by the way. Yeah? <laughs> and then I have to lift it up, you know? I'm like struggling and the air hostess is watching me, who's this brown dude, you know, after 9-11, doing all these crazy things, yeah? I'm like struggling, but I have to act as if it's light, you know, after I'm smiling, yeah? <laughs> so that's effort and grace, yeah? It's this, that's life. So most people live on the edge of the circle, which is creation, destruction, creation, destruction. We're like, buffeted by waves of change. Even by the time you're listening to me, thousands of cells in your body have died, thousands have been created, nothing stays the same. Everything is in flux, okay? We're in a quantum soup. 
But when you take a spinning wheel or a spinning circle, the wheel of samsara of our lives, there's one thing that doesn't change. What's the one thing that doesn't change, Joe? The heart. And where's the heart? Right where the center is. The center of a circle is a heart which is a seat of pure consciousness. That's where the I am resides. That's what the Upanishads say. Your true nature is literally in the heart. It, the Upanishads say consciousness is the size of a thumb smack in your heart. So when you say I am 10 or I am 40, we know intuitively there's an entity that doesn't change. It's there before you're born. It's there after you die. It's always there. That is the goal, really the goal of, you know, for some people, the moksha, okay? Many people are content twisting into a pretzel, okay? So what Shiva says is life is a dance. It's chaotic. You have to embrace. I got branded by Lululemon the other day. <laughs> it says, embrace the unexpected, yeah? That's, that's beautiful. That's Shiva. That's the dance of Shiva. You do not try to make the dance a drama. Always a dance, okay? You are able to objectify yourself, but know who you are, pure consciousness. So when you chant the mantra, Om Namah Shivaya, the word Shiva literally means the divine, auspicious nature of reality. God is everywhere, including us. So the metaphor given in the Upanishads is like a spider spinning its web from itself. Everything is divine. So the creator and the created are the same. So when you realize that, there's the same God in you, which is the God in me. There's the same God in the environment as, as me. It's like, you're not going to hurt people. You're not going to hurt the environment. It is like hurting yourself. Okay. So automatically, like Gandhi used this very beautifully to and the nonviolence method to shift humanity. Okay. So that comes from the deep spiritual teachings of knowing who you are. That's why this will always persist. A hundred years from now, there'll be another guy schlepping murtis and saying the same thing, okay? <laughs> because the teachings are timeless. That's the idea. So here's how, what would you, you would do to work with Shiva as your archetype. And you may have any archetype you choose, it's your choice. It's like a major in college. You choose your major or a buffet at lunch. You just choose who you connect with. And please, if you have any questions as we go along, ask away, okay? It may help you keep awake too. So if Shiva is your archetype, there are some practices you can do with Shiva. So you'd create an altar with candles, flowers, and meditate a few minutes in front of Shiva. Make it a sacred spot in your home. And when you meditate, people try to focus on stilling the mind, the thoughts. And that's obvious. That's the entire premise of Patanjali Yoga, Yoga Chitta Vritta Nirodha, cessation of fluctuations of the mind. And it's hard. It takes a whole lifetime, if not more. Yeah. No need to do that. Counterintuitively, it's not the thoughts that are relevant. It's the space or the gap between your thoughts because the space between your thoughts is pure consciousness. In other words, your thoughts are overlaid on consciousness. So when you meditate and thoughts recede in your mind, your mind is suffused with pure consciousness. It's like a vacuum. At that moment, open your eyes to Shiva. The mind sucks in all the energy he represents, and you awaken the archetype of Shiva within you. It's a simple but powerful technique. Yogis have been doing this for centuries. You know. That's how you'd invoke the archetype, they are within us. Besides this one way, there are three other ways to practice with your archetype in your day-to-day -day life, because as I said, yoga is primarily of the mat. And if someone's interested, we can have a separate conversation, I can tell you how, how to do that. There's another way, the fifth way, which is to do nothing, okay? It's a lazy way, it's called um, darshan. People stand for hours in a line in a temple in India to get a darshan, a viewpoint of a deity, a gaze. So you can just put them in your home and get a darshan. But you think you're looking at them, they're looking at you. That's called kataksham, when the deity looks at you. Sometimes a single gaze is enough to shift people, I've noticed that. Okay. So let me switch gears and speak about Ganesh just because he's my archetype.
probably because of my belly too, yeah. <laughs> so I remember a friend of mine, uh, Dean, he, you were the first Bhakti Fest, right, Baba? So he actually got married at the first Bhakti Fest uh, six years ago. And they bought a Ganesh, you know, for the wedding. And if you Google Ganesh and Huffington Post, Dean wrote an article a few months ago in the HuffPo, and he put a picture of that Ganesh about this size, and he put a picture of John Goodman, you know. And they look pretty similar, if you ask me. That, eh? <laughs> and basically, he talked about this mudra, you know, the Abhaya. Like John Goodman says in Big Lebowski, you know, not everything is effed up, dude, you know. <laughs> so basically, Ganesh says, hey, it's okay, chill, I got you covered. Things are okay, yeah? That's the Abhaya Mudra, okay? But as you know, he's considered the remover of obstacles, a gatekeeper, a threshold deity in your life. And when Shiva encounters this boy, for some of you who know the story, and thanks to MC Yogi Baba, he spread the story to so many new people about Shiva meeting Ganesh. You know, this boy, the threshold, and the boy, you know, with the big, the head gets chopped off, the head gets transplanted to Ganesh, etc. But that, that, that encounter changes two people. And it also change, changes yoga. Because Shiva was before Pashupati, an ascetic. Pashu means animals. Uh, Pati is like ruler. He was ruler of animals. That's the old classical yoga, which is basically caging the beast within, Chitta Vitta Nirodaha. And after that encounter, that boy changes to Ganapati, and Shiva changes to a householder, Nataraja. So Shiva gets corralled to be a householder. The yoga changes. What Gana means is like beings or groups. Human beings, we like to congregate in groups, you know, like here or different yoga styles, etc. And Pati is ruler, so he's a ruler of groups. So that's why yoga is not done as in the old days solitary, it's being done in groups now everywhere in the world. It's like that movie Rambo, right? So Sylvester Stallone comes into town, he's a Vietnam War vet, he takes apart the whole town, and they, at the end they put him in jail. And that's the classical yoga, caging the beast within. Subsequent movies of Rambo, he takes the same feelings, the gana, the feelings in a mind, you don't deny the feelings, the feelings of anger, jealousy, etc. You channelize them to a higher cause. So he liberates like war prisoners from uh, Afghanistan in subsequent movies. That's the new yoga. Things are done in groups. I don't know if this metaphor is valid or not. Yeah? <laughs> I, think I, I don't think I did a good job here. Okay. okay. Every Ganesh has a mouse. Okay? The mouse is his vehicle, Vahana. So this big pot-bellied elephant dude, you know, you've you got to have a relationship. When you get very close to them, you can make fun of them and let them make fun of you. That's, that's the relationship you want, okay? It's archetypical. So Ganesh rides on this mouse, but symbolically the mouse represents your mind because your mind wanders like the way the mouse campers. So when Ganesh rides on the mouse, he calms your wavering mind. And in your life, there have been instances where you're in a zone, things flow, you don't sense obstacles. So the real obstacles in your life are not out there. They're within you as vrittis or fluctuations of the mind. That's the secret, how he removes obstacles. Okay, It's not out there, it's here. It's called the inner vignas, the inner obstacles. That's how he removes them. When the mind is calm, that's only step number one. Step number two is he has you do a U-turn to go within and realize the true source of joy, which is you. So the teachings of Vedanta tell us your true nature is joy. It's actually what is called ananta, which is infinite in Sanskrit, ananta. So when everything about you is whole and complete, when you're infinite, there's nothing that can be added to make you more complete. So the word ananda comes from ananta, okay? That's why he holds a sweet here. He points to his sweet here. This is the sweet of enlightenment. It's called satchit ananda. Sat is truth of what is and who you are, pure consciousness. 
Chit is awareness, ananda is bliss. So when you're aware of your true nature as unconditioned consciousness, you're in bliss. Okay? Notice where the mouse is, right under that. So maybe it waits for a little dribble. Yeah? And that's the path of yoga. I keep telling you that. It's always effort and grace. We can be like the mouse. We surrender. Have you seen a mouse calm? He's in total, he's a mouse is a yogi. Okay, in this case. That's why in Ganesh temples, when you go to India, you'll see a big mouse in front of Ganesh. Okay? Deep symbolisms here. Okay? Now, again, there's meanings of the broken tusk, there's an axe, there's a noose, there's a lot of deep metaphors here. But basically, Ganesh is for bringing change into your life okay? and success. I remember an incident about eight years ago, I was at a yoga journal conference in Wisconsin, and a guy walks up to me, he was a guy in his 60s, an elderly gentleman who was a retired school teacher, and he said he wanted to buy a Ganesh for his um, wife who just finished her teacher training, 200 hours. So Ganesh is normally given as a threshold, as I said. So I explained to him all these symbols of Ganesh and how to work with him. He said, all this is fine, but I don't believe you. He said, I'm an atheist. Now, even atheism itself is a belief of no belief, but I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole, yeah? <laughs> He's a potential customer too, yeah? <laughs> so I said, as you wish, sir. But he still wanted to buy a Ganesh, so he bought a standing Ganesh, and he carried it out to present to his wife, and five minutes he comes running back. He said, at that very moment, he and his wife won a drawing for a cruise to the Bahamas. That was worth like a few thousand dollars at that time, you know? And he was amazed. It's nothing like this has happened to them before. And the whole day he wouldn't let go of Ganesh. <laughs> <laughs> you heard that before, Karina. So he was, I mean, it sometimes takes a little experience to convince you. And he since then becomes a devotee, He's, becomes a yoga teacher himself, he teaches meditation, mantras, so. <laughs> I've seen Ganesh shift so many people, okay. Now, another question can be asked, okay, who's been to India in this group? Okay, it's quite a few. So when you go to India, have you seen the Indians refer to these deities as archetypes? No, they would say they're real, right? They would say, hey, what are you talking about? And I grew up in Mumbai, and then I come here to do graduate school, and. Um, you know, I grew up with the stories, and it's, it's fun, but I always sort of thought they're mythology, you know. And quite frankly, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a healthy skeptic. I still am. I'm a, I grew up agnostic. Because you are taught a lot of rituals while growing up, but they don't teach you the meanings, you know. And unfortunately, that's the missing thread. The knowledge is the missing thread. So you sort of take it for granted when it's a very rich culture including here. I know you grew up here with Indian parents and similar issues, you know. Um, but then, you know, I got into this about 14 years ago and I was influenced by Deepak Chopra. I used to teach at Deepak's retreats and Deepak introduced me to them as archetypes. It's all wonderful, very beautifully intellectual, very grabbing. But then I could never reconcile to the fact, are they real or are they archetypes? And I just want to share a quick experience with you, which actually gave me the, the shraddha, the faith, that not only they are archetypes, they are real. They're as real as you and me. And you can find out from yourself too. Some of you may have heard this experience. But imagine a, a story where 5,000 years ago, Shiva and his wife Shakti or Parvati had a conversation. And the conversation was about everyone's lives in the universe. So for instance, uh, Shakti would ask Shiva. So in tantric texts, when Shakti asks Shiva, it's called Agama. When Shiva would ask Shakti, it's Nigama. So Shakti would ask Shiva, when did Manoj meet Natalie? And Shiva responded in Park City, Utah, about eight years ago. And Natalie is a yoga teacher in Whistler, of all places. Yeah? And at that time, she buys a beautiful Hanuman. Yeah? And this conversation was recorded by Ganesha. He's a god of writers, that's why he has a broken tusk. And this was revealed to seven enlightened sages. And in that state of enlightenment, there's no time, no space. You're above. Time and space comes from maya, okay? 
So it's like a painting. You know, you go close to the painting, you see a little bit. You go further away, you get a bigger picture. Okay? In physics, it's called the observer effect. What is being observed depends on the vantage point of the observer. It's a very common phenomenon in quantum physics. So these seven sages were able to observe everyone's lives through a conversation between Shiva and Shakti, which was shared to them by Ganesha. And they wrote down on these scrolls, called Nadi scrolls, N-A-D-I, Nadi, which are nothing more than palm leaves. And these got passed down generation to generation from like thousands of years ago, right now it's in the hands of a few family in South India, in a little village called Vaitheswaran Koil. And I'd heard about them, but I wasn't sure. I'm, you know, I'm, I was skeptical. But I, about 10 years ago, I went on a pilgrimage to India, and I went into that town, you know, by accident. I wasn't planning to go there. I was visiting many temples, and I, I just woke up from a jet lag while the driver was driving me, and I saw the sign. I told the driver, go for it. So we end up staying in a hotel. There's only one hotel in that little village. And next day, bright and, bright and early, I go to the Nadi center. They take my right thumbprint. And for women, it's a left thumbprint. Because your thumbprint is encoding of all the 108 different paths karma can take you. So the guy said, wait here. I'll go in the back. I'll get a bundle of scrolls. And we have to narrow down which one is yours. So he goes in the library, takes a long time, because everything takes a long time in India. <laughs> Comes with a bundle of scrolls, and he solemnly unwraps it, chants a mantra, Om, Trayambakam, Yajamahe, etc. And he instructs me, do not answer any, do not volunteer any answer to any question posed in the scrolls, just answer yes or no. So I said, okay, you know, I did that Indian shake. Yeah. <laughs> it's neither yes, yes nor no, yeah? And the first question was, your name is Prakash. I said, no. So he tossed the scroll. Another, <laughs> you were born 10 June 1950. I said, no. Another, you have two sisters. I said, no. He kept going on. And then the bundle would get over. You'll get another bundle from the back. Take a long time. <laughs> and then your mother's name is uh, Prakasha. I said, no. He kept going. Now, like what I do for a living. He said, you're a doctor. I said, no, I'm a PhD, a poor and hungry doctor. Yeah. <laughs> An MD is a money doctor. Yeah. <laughs> it kept going on and on. And finally, you know, I, I hope you're not a doctor. Yeah. I, I, I probably insulted some doctors here. Yeah. Um, I'm like beginning to give up. It's like hot. It's South India. There's no, you know, air conditioning. All of a sudden, a scroll pops up. It said, your name is Manoj Chalam. I was right. But I thought they got it from the hotel I stayed last night. <laughs> Indians are very smart. <laughs> yeah. But then the next question said, you were born 12th May 1962. And I start to feel chills because nobody had that information. And then it said, your mother's name is Raja Lakshmi. Correct. Most Indian names are named after deities. It said, your father's name is Venkada Chalam. Correct. It said your wife's name means someone that means light. And Jyoti means light in Sanskrit. It said your daughter's age is 10. And I, you know, that was 10 years ago. Now she's 20. It said um, Ganesh is my Ishta Devata, my archetype. And that's true. I've always felt a connection with Ganesh, you know. And get this. It said I live overseas and I import art of a spiritual nature. That kind of threw me because it also tells you it is time sensitive. F few years before, I wasn't doing this. I was in high tech. You know, I was a CEO of a software company and I got fired. And then Ganesh came into my life and whacked me on the head. <laughs> yeah, he said, do your Swadharma. So it knew I was coming that day because it told me my itinerary for the next two days. So everything was known. You know, this is quite near Chidambaram Baba, where you've been about half hour from Chidamaram. And then it said we recently started to teach, which is about 12 years ago. And uh, it said I help find people's archetypes, people's Ishta Devatas. And that's in a nutshell what I do. I help, when I look at you, even though you're a, you know, you're a yogi and a cameraman, 
there's a good chance I know what your archetype is. It just comes to me. It's about 80% accuracy, okay? It's also Lakshmi, you create beauty, yeah? You may not know what Lakshmi is, it doesn't matter. That's the form speaks to you, that's how you know your archetype. It's about 80% accurate, it keeps me humble too. <laughs> but it kept going on and on further, okay? It talked about, you know, how our teachings would progress. It said we'll build a temple and we built a temple in, you know, in our warehouse and Jyoti said, hey, isn't that what the scrolls is saying? It talked about health issues. Finally, the scroll said, okay, the guy said, this is giving me the date, you're going to die. Do you want to know? He gave me a choice. So yeah, I said, I want to. I'm like rocking and rolling. I want to know everything. So it actually gave me the day I'm going to pass away. It's good for health insurance, life insurance, yeah? <laughs> it's on a Friday, the fourth week of April, and it's comfortably far away. Okay. I was like flabbergasted because it's one thing to understand them as mythology and stories, but man, they, they're as real as you and me. That was, the, that was the stuff that hit me, okay? All the teachings of yoga, how many teachers are here in this group, yoga teachers? Excellent. You know, many of you have invested so much time and dedication and passion. The teachings are something coming from deep and they are real, okay? It's as real as you and me. It's all coming from these deities. A lot of yoga, okay? That gave me the faith. To me, that is the real message here, that, you know, it's not that my life is important, but the teachings are real. We come and go. So, let me check how much time I have. Okay, not too much. So, the teachings are meant to lead you to this stage, okay, that is what Jyoti talked about, moksha. This is what is called moksha tandava. When Shiva dances as Nataraj, he's called ananda tandava, the dance of joy. And there are 108 poses in the dance, and it culminates in this one, moksha. And true liberation, so moksha means living liberated, the state of jiva mukta. True liberation in this case comes from the flame Shiva holds. This is the fire of jnana, the fire of illuminated wisdom, which burns a thousand lifetimes of avidya. The Latin word video to see comes from vidya, knowledge. Avidya means we're basically ignorant of our true nature, who we are. So it's like a thousand years of darkness is dispelled by a single source of light because the darkness was never there. It's an absence of light. Light and darkness can never coexist. So only knowledge, the message here is only knowledge can get you enlightened. It is not experiential. So according to Vedanta, whatever is experienced is not real. And whatever is real can never be experienced. Okay. So in other words, you know, the samadhi in Patanjali Yoga is fantastic. You get that oneness, sama, di. Di comes from buddhi, the oneness with everything in the universe. So you spend a lot of time in meditation, do samadhi, and then you go out, start driving, feel great. Somebody cuts you off, shows you the finger. <laughs> You're back in the vrittis, yeah? <laughs> so that is all experiential based, okay? What we say is it's an identity shift. Knowledge is irreversible, okay? You know directly who you are. However, yoga, meditation, and chanting, etc., is essential on this path. It's like cleaning the dust in the mirror of your mind. Okay? It's what, is, what we call chitta shuddhi. Then the teachings of knowledge go in and get ignited. Okay? And you realize your true nature. So that is the flame Shiva holds. The Dhamaru means time and space comes from within you. And the great sages know that the world comes from within them. And the hands going back represents ultimate freedom. So in other words, freedom while alive, while embodied. No need to die and go to heaven. The teachings say your true nature is heaven. And a spontaneous alchemy of transformation happens where the legs go up, hands go down. But as opposed to doing a handstand in yoga where the hands and leg muscles are contorted with stress, look at the hands, it's bent. He's doing a one-handed handstand the hand being bent, 
Look at the legs, it's gracefully up. And that's because upon enlightenment, the key feature is the sense of doership vanishes. Everything becomes effortless grace. Look how gracefully the legs are almost like flying, okay? So the, the sense of doership vanishing is the key feature upon enlightenment. Even apasmara has flipped the being of forgetfulness, okay? What this means is one still has to do sadhana, practice, yogic practice to maintain that state. It's like being established in that state, okay? But the old karmas, that also represents the old karmas, which we come into the world with a backpack of these karmas, is called prarabdha karma, that has to play out. It's like a fan being switched off. At the moment of enlightenment, the switch is off, you lose your sense of doership, but the fan still takes a while coming to a stop. So the old karmas have to play out. For instance, Ramana Marshi, one of the greatest sages of the last century, he had throat cancer many years after enlightenment. But to him, it felt like a mosquito bite. He's beyond the body. So one still has to do the practice. So it says like the Zen saying, before enlightenment, one chops wood carries water. After enlightenment, one chops wood carries water. On the surface, the sages look like any other person. But underneath, they know they're not truly doing anything. So this is the culmination of all spiritual paths. It all goes to moksha. So the point I'm trying to bring out is these forms of these deities are basically expressions of the same philosophy. Okay? And there's this concept of a personal archetype which is very compelling. And they help you wherever you are in your life. Be it personal, professional, spiritual, wherever you are. So we can, you know, we usually speak for 16 hours. It's limited time, I know many of you are not attending classes. So if you want to continue this conversation, please meet us at the conference center. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.